I, I, I so love that passage of scripture. And so today, um, or last week, I, I shared a message from Daniel about how to identify God's voice. Um, those are all on Facebook. If you uh, are able to, to go on Facebook and see that, here pretty soon, hopefully within the next week or so, Corey's worked real hard to get uh, our website changed over from the former host to Share Faith, which is going to be much better. And we're hoping that's going to happen real soon within the next week or so. And then you can just go on the website to get the messages. And so last week, uh, it was a message about hearing God's voice. I'm going to kind of recap that for you in just a moment. But today, I want us to think about the necessity to hear God's voice. It is absolutely necessary for God's people to hear his voice. Can you say amen? amen? You see, there are many voices in our world today. And sometimes, sometimes hearing and understanding the voice is crucial. And so, as I said last week, we talked about how to identify the voice of God. You recall that... Uh, these are some of the things that we talked about. When you're hearing this voice and you're trying to understand and decide whether or not it is God who is doing the speaking, here's a question you might ask. Is what I'm hearing consistent with the Word of God? For God will never say anything that is inconsistent with His Word. Secondly, does what I'm hearing conflict with human reasoning? If you look at all the things that Jesus said and did most of the time it was totally opposite of human reasoning he would say that he must do this or do that or do the other and then uh, the, the the world would think well that's the craziest thing i've ever heard about you remember you recall reading how he talked about being crucified and and that was just totally something that didn't um, line up with human reasoning at all to be crucified and the three days would rise again I'm also reminded of the time that Peter uh, and the disciples had fished all night and hadn't caught anything. And Jesus shows up and he says, throw your net on the other side of the boat. And Peter's human reasoning kicked in and said, but we've been fishing here all night and haven't caught a thing. Nevertheless, nevertheless, we'll do what you said. And of course, you know the story. They filled the nets up so much so they couldn't hardly haul them into the boat. And then the third thing is, does what I'm hearing clash with my fleshly nature? You see, your flesh and the spirit are always at war with one another. And so, your flesh will desire you to do one thing, while the spirit, God's Holy Spirit, is instructing you to do otherwise. A fourth thing, does what I'm hearing challenge my faith? What is God up to in your life? He is up to challenging your faith. Because as the days grow more evil, and as times grow more difficult, which seems like they might be kind of headed that way. I don't know. Um, but, but what is God up to? He wants to build your faith so that no matter what the circumstances are, you, you can rest in him. You know that he's going to take care of you. Someone asked me the other day if I thought this was the end of times. And I said, well, I don't know. It might be. And said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to continue to trust the Lord because he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He said, I've never seen his uh, seed begging bread. And so I believe he's going to take care of me. The fifth thing you might ask is, does what I'm hearing call for courage? I remember several times speaking, talking with someone in the church, particularly uh, Kevin Cox. Kevin Cox shared with me one day, he was at the hospital. He saw this uh, lady there who was really struggling and having a hard time. And the first impression of his heart was to go pray with her. He said, I was scared to get this, Brother Mike. He said, I, I, I didn't know what to do. He said, but I, I just kept hearing this voice in my heart saying, go pray with her. Go pray with her. Go pray with her. He said, I finally got the courage to do that. And what a joy it was. So does what I'm hearing call for courage? Almost always it will when God is speaking. A sixth thing is how will what I'm hearing affect others? God would never tell you to do anything that would adversely affect someone else. He causes us to always think of others, to think of others first, to consider others before ourselves. A seventh thing would be, does what I'm hearing caution me to be patient? 
The Bible says that God tells us to be still and know that he is God. To wait, I say, wait upon the Lord. And so if this voice that you're hearing is hurry up, rush, rush, do this, do that, or do the other, you better put a check on it. It probably is not God. And then an eighth thing. Does what I'm hearing cause me to consider future consequences? You better believe it does. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to uh, over the years who have talked to me about getting married. And they tell me that the person they're about to be married to is not a believer. And they are. And I tell them, the word says, do not be unevenly yoked in your marriage. Oh, but I love this person. And I think that this person will eventually come around. And more often than not, they don't. And it winds up being disastrous. God will always tell you to consider future consequences when he is speaking. And the ninth thing with me is what I'm hearing leading me to seek out godly counsel. Psalm 1 says that blessed is the man who walks in the counsel, uh, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. And so the opposite would be true. Blessed is the man who walks in the counsel of the godly. Now, I don't know about you, Brother Jameson or Corey, you guys that... Uh, Brother Jody, you guys that do counseling and people come to you and they, they want to know uh, what they should do or, or how they should respond and they, they, to help them make a decision and you give them godly counsel and they refuse to hear and then they go to someone who is totally disconnected from the Lord, who, has nothing to, who knows nothing about the word and they take their counsel. Blessed is the man who walks in the counsel of the godly. And then number 10, does what I'm hearing contribute to my spiritual growth? God is always wanting to grow us spiritually, to daily conform us to the image of his son so that we automatically understand and hear his voice and obey. And then the last thing would be, does what I'm hearing bring peace? Listen, if if you're hearing this voice, this voice is telling you to do something, but it is causing an unrest, an anxiety, that's probably not God. What we need to do is to understand what's being said and does, does it bring a peace in my heart, a peace in my life, a peace that passes understanding. Well, today, I want us to understand that hundreds of times the Bible speaks of God speaking audibly. Yes, he does. He, he, just because he did many times uh, in the old days doesn't mean that he can't do it again today. I mean, there are hundreds of accounts in the scriptures where he has, where he has audibly spoken to people. But we need to understand that all of those times that he spoke audibly to people, this took place, this spanned a time of about 4,000 years. And I would submit to you today that God does not always speak audibly today. That's not usually the, the typical. That is, not, that is not the standard rule. Usually God speaks to us in other ways. Sometimes God speaks to us through circumstances. You recall that those early Christians in Jerusalem were determined to stay there in Jerusalem. But what did God do? God allowed... And he didn't bring the persecution, but he stepped back and he allowed persecution to come into the church. And the Bible says that all of the Christians, except for the apostles, were scattered abroad. Why? So that the gospel could go forward. So sometimes God speaks to us through circumstances. He is in the business of conforming us to the image of his son. And sometimes God allows harsh things, difficult things, to come into our life to teach us to lean on Him. Sometimes God speaks to us through His Holy Spirit. And I love the book of John. I especially love John 14, John 15, John 16. In John chapter 16, listen to what He says. He says, beginning in, let me find it here, verse 13. He says, well, he says in verse 12, he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, 
He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. He will speak it to you. He will let you know. And so then he says in verse 15, And all that the Father has is mine, and therefore I say that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So sometimes God speaks to us through his Holy Spirit. God still speaks today primarily through his word. And so if you want to hear God speak, you need to spend time in the word. So you will recognize the voice of God. The Bible contains everything we need to know about life and how to live our life as a Christian in a way that brings glory to Him and brings victory in our own personal life. You know the Bible is made up of 66 books, 39, uh, 39 books in the Old Testament uh, that prophesies the coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. There are 27 books in the New Testament that they don't prophesy the coming of Jesus. They present Jesus when he came. And so there are 66 books, and every one of them are about the Lord Jesus Christ. This book took about 1,500 years to compile, to come together. Over 40 authors, and yet there is not one single contradiction in the Bible. Nowhere. There are those who say the Bible contradicts itself, but I submit to you, there is not one contradiction. There is no, no rips, no tears, no runs, no errors. My friend, it is the absolute truth, the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, 17. Uh, one of our texts today says this, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness. Notice that it says, first of all, that it is profitable for doctrine, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. It says that it is profitable for doctrine. Well, what is doctrine? Doctrine is all the things that the Bible teaches. There's the doctrine of Jesus Christ, the doctrine of God the Father, the doctrine of Holy Spirit, the doctrine of Scripture. There, that's what, that's what doctrine is. It is what the Bible contains. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14 says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men or the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Listen, there are all kinds of voices out there and those voices out there that are contrary to the doctrine of the scriptures is a, vo is a voice that is leading you astray, that is causing you to be tossed to and fro as children, to believe this one day and to believe something else the next day. I love this scripture here, 1 Peter 1, 3. His divine power, watch this. His divine power has given us everything we need for life, and godliness through our, what? Our knowledge, our knowledge of him gained through the reading and the meditation of scriptures of him who called us by his own glory. And second of all, it says that it is profitable for rebuking or profitable for conviction. And you remember the story how David sinned with Bathsheba and Nathan the prophet came to him and Nathan told him this parable told this parable about this, this rich man who had a lot of lambs, a lot of sheep, and this poor man who had only one. It was a pet, and he loved this dear little lamb. And so this, this uh, uh, rich man had a guest come, and, and instead of uh, killing and slaughtering one of his own lambs for dinner, he took the one and only poor uh, lamb of the poor shepherd and killed that little lamb, that pet lamb. And David became furious. And so Nathan looked at him. David said, that man ought to pay fourfold. And this is going to happen. And that's going to happen. And Nathan looked at him. And I believe with compassion and sorrow and, and, and love in his heart. And he said, oh, but David, 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 what I'm telling you is you are that man that I just described. And the Bible says that David was struck in his heart. The Bible says that David said, I have sinned against the Lord. 
I have sinned against the Lord. Hebrews chapter 4, here's what the Word of God does. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Listen, it won't just rebuke you for the things that you do, but literally to the intents and the thoughts of your heart. You ever had one of those really not so good thoughts or intentions come into your heart and and the conviction was there and holy spirit would say that's not right that's wrong that is inconsistent with the word of god in order for you to know that you must spend some time in the word of god this says it is profitable for correction and correction always begins with repentance amen first john 1 9 says that if uh, we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Well, I, I don't know about you, but I, I would rather have the conviction and the correction of the scriptures than I would my dad. Now, I don't know about you, but my dad was a very strict disciplinarian. And he was just downright mean. And my dad was the kind of person that Whenever he would hit you with a board or a piece of water hose or a stick or a crutch, he walked on crutches a lot, whatever it was, he'd lift you off the ground. And we, and we always went in a circle. I, I, I couldn't run. I couldn't break loose and run. He grabbed me by the collar. And, and I hated those long rebukes, Brother Corey, because he would be, he would grab me by the collar and say, I told you not to go over there. I like the short ones. Don't do that. I didn't mind them too bad. Any of y'all identify with that? <laughs> I much rather have the conviction and the correction of the scripture. Amen. That just kind of hurts your heart. But dads hurt the heart and the other end too. Well, it's profitable for correction. It's also profitable, the Bible says, for training in righteousness. Did you know that athletes have to spend hours training for whatever it is they do in whatever sport? They have to spend hours in training. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I, maybe you might think I'm pretty barbaric. But I, I like ultimate fighting. I like UFC. Anybody else like UFC? Oh, see, so there's several of us barbarians in here, right? But uh, these guys, they, they, their physique just amazes me. They, they, and, and, but in order to be that way, they've got to train every day for hours. I was talking to my brother Landon there earlier today uh, about having to take training. I, I, many of you know that I... I time take care of the sewer around here and, uh, well sometimes it takes care of me but anyway in, in order to keep my certification in my license I have to have 16 hours of continuous training every year and so and also because I work for the city of Grand Cane city of Grand Cane the village of Grand Cane I have to take ethics training which I just took the other day and so you, you have to do that in order to in order to be in right standing well, it's also true for the Christian. If you're going to do what God has called you to do, what God has gifted you to do, it takes training. Now, many of you have probably been through some kind of evangelism training, um, uh, faith, maybe, faith uh, evangelism, uh, some of the other uh, evangelism training sessions. But, but you learn from that. You learn how to share your faith. I mean... You, it's, it's pretty, it doesn't, doesn't really work too well for you to just walk up and uh, put somebody in a headlock. I think to tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ. You, you need to be trained about how to, how to open the conversation and how to turn that person's heart toward listening to what you have to say, what you have to share. It takes training. It takes training. However God has gifted you for the work of the ministry, whatever that might be. You, you, need to, you need training. And Scripture tells us how to do each of these things. The Word of God is designed to provide training. And we, we, uh, th 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 this is the only tool, really. That ultimately, this is the tool we need for training. You know what it is? All Scripture is profitable 
for training in righteousness, training, learning how, what it means, how to live for the Lord, how to serve the Lord. Well, let me close very quickly with this. I want, to, I want us to look and to see how all of this applies. Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, where uh, Jesus has a message for each of the churches. And in each of those churches, he has something to say. He exhorts them. He says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. And so the first church that he talks about right here is the church of Ephesus. Well, notice in verse uh, chapter 2, or verse 2, chapter 2, he says, I know your works. Listen, God knows. Don't think for one second that God doesn't know exactly what you're doing, where you're doing it, how you're doing it, why you're doing it. God knows. Amen? And so he says, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. Now, I, I, I've, I've been in a quandary about some of this. I still don't know the, the answer. Maybe you can help me out. When he said, you, you cease to do the works that you did at first. Notice what he says. He says that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Now, here's my question. Is, is he saying you have abandoned the love for Jesus Christ? Is that what he's saying? Or is he saying that you have abandoned the love for your brother? Is that what he's saying? I don't really know for sure if it's either one of those. Watch this. Notice that he says, the love you had at first. What was the very, uh, the greatest commandment that, that Jesus told us? He said, what is the greatest commandment? Do what? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, all your will. Did he not? That's the greatest commandment. And he said, the second is like the first, your neighbor as yourself. And so when I read this, here, here's what I think. I think he's saying, not so much that he, they don't love the Lord Jesus Christ. Because look, he commends them. He says, your toil, your patient endurance. And how you become, you cannot bear those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. He says, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Does that sound like a, a loss for the love of Jesus Christ? That doesn't to me, commending them for that. Does it sound like a loss for the love of the brethren? It might to you, but it doesn't to me. He commended them for their work in the ministry. So what is he saying? You have, you have lost your first love. You've abandoned your first love. Here's what I think. Now, this is my opinion. I can't prove it. This is just my opinion, okay? This is uh, Brother Mike's cornbread and peas theology, okay? Whatever you want to call it. I think what he's saying is, you're not giving me your best like you did at first. Yeah. And too often the church today gives God second best. We give him what's left over. We, we prepare to teach and, and to preach, but we stay up all night Saturday night watching gun smoke. And then we get up early Sunday morning to try to cram teaching into Sunday morning. We give God second best. I, I think that's what he's saying here. And I wish I had some time, but I, I'm about out of time, so, so let me hurry to say. And I'm just throwing that out there for you to think about. I, I think he's saying, I'm no longer first place in your life. I'm second or third or maybe even fourth. Is Jesus your priority number one these days? I think if he is, a lot of our lives would change. Secondly, into the church of Smyrna. Notice that there is no conviction at all. He simply commends them. He says 
in verse 9 again, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich and the slander of those who say that they are the Jews and are not but are the synagogue of Satan. So they're under heavy persecution and heavy trial. No conviction, only commendation for this church. He commends them. You see, the church, uh, the word of God is profitable for what? For doctrine, for reproof for correction and training in righteousness. These people obviously were following and being trained in righteousness because God had no words of conviction for them. And then in the church of Pergamos, he says again in verse 13, I, in chapter 2, verse 13, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name, and you do not deny my faith, and even the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, and you have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak uh, to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans, Therefore, repent, or I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword. And so what he says here is there's false doctrine in the church. The church was tolerating false doctrine. Church, we can never do that. Amen? We can never allow anyone to come in here and just begin to preach and to teach false doctrine. Not only that. He, he's saying that, that you have, you, you have a, a church who, obviously, if you're listening to false doctrine, you, you've got some people who disagree with the word. You've got some people who are obviously adding to the word. You've got some people who are obviously taking away from the word. And there is a stark, stark warning in the book of Revelation that we are neither to add to or to take away from the word of God. Amen. And then he says to the church of Thyatira, he says again in verse 19, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patience and endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching, seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality, to eat food, uh, sacrifice to idols. Listen, he's saying here's a church who was tolerating sexual immorality. And I submit to you today the things that I read and hear and see that sexual immorality is really creeping hard and heavy even into the church. Are you hearing me, church? Paul had something to say about sexual immorality in the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Listen to what he says. Verse 1, he says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant and ought not to rather mourn. Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Listen. Notice, notice here's, here's something that I want you to see. Listen. This wasn't somebody's little, little gossip thing about, Hey, did you know about oh, so-and-so and he's sleeping around or she's sleeping around with this one or that one. He's doing this. He's doing that. Why he's, you know, all he does his time is consumed with pornography on the internet. Listen, this wasn't somebody who just walked around yakking, gossiping in somebody's ear. Notice that he says, it is actually reported. Listen, that is the word of the Greek language that means holy. W-H-O-L-L-Y. In other words, all together. So he's saying that the church of Corinth was a church that everybody in that church knew exactly what was going on with this man who was sleeping with his daddy's wife. Now he goes on to say what ought to happen is that man ought to be, he ought to be, uh, we ought to withdraw fellowship from that, to turn him over to the world. The Bible says turn him over to Satan. Well, what he's saying is turn him over to a world Satan where Satan, uh, to a world system where Satan is in control. The church ought not to ever tolerate sexual immorality. And I wanted to spend some time there, but I'm out of time. So I'm going to go back to my scripture in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 again. And we'll move on to the church of Sardis. Notice again in chapter 3 where he says 
in verse 2, he says, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. In other words, he's saying, he's saying your church is, is full of hypocrisy. You go around and you talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk. Amen? Know what he's saying? He says, he says, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and, and is about to die. In other words, listen, church, if we've got some area of our ministry that needs strengthened, then those of us who recognize and see that and are gifted to do it, then step up and let's strengthen it before it dies. Amen? There is too much to lose and so much to gain if we'll just step up. Look at the church of Philadelphia. No conviction. But again, notice in verse 8, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know you have kept, uh, you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Another church that was under severe persecution, but because of their love for God, they hung in there. And then there's the church, and I'll close with this. The church of Laodicea. Notice verse 15. I know your works. You are neither hot or cold or hot. Would you that you were either hot or cold? So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Well, I just want to ask you, my friend, listen. Are you lukewarm today? Have you checked your spiritual temperature lately? Are you on fire for God? Or have you kind of cooled down a little bit? And you're just lukewarm. Is there no spring in your step? Is there no fire in your heart? No fire in your spirit? Are you not like Jeremiah who said, I cannot help but tell you about the Lord God. Where are you? Have you checked your spiritual temperature lately? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What the Spirit has to say to the churches. I wanted to talk about church discipline, but let me close on this. Church discipline has three purposes. First of all, to maintain the reputation and integrity of the local church. Amen. Amen. Listen, folks. Born again believers are to walk in purity. Secondly, to help disciple and restore an erring covenant brother or sister. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, he says, if a brother or sister stumbles, if they fall, you who are spiritual, you go to that one in a spirit of meekness and gentleness and you seek to restore that brother or sister to fellowship and understand that you can be guilty and fall to the same temptation. And last, to cause other Christians not to sin. 1 Timothy 5 20 says, those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest also may fear. Strengthen what is weak. The witness of our church needs to be strong. Stronger more today than ever. In a time when the virus runs rampant in our country, when politicians are so divided they can't make a decision about how to help the American people. When politicians are so hypocritical in their supposedly Christian walk and stance. Christians who would, are professing Christians who would claim to pray for those who are hurting and yet would put their mark or their stamp of approval on abortion. Our nation is in trouble. We need to be praying for our country, praying for our leaders, praying for our churches. Amen.